Thank you everyone for joining. Today we are having our webinar about virtual events and in particular, uh, virtual event analytics. Uh, we are in this world where there's a, um, a big change in the way that we convene and the, the way in which we engage our audiences uh, through lots of different roles, departments, channels. Um, and, and with the big focus on virtual events, we really wanted to dedicate some time to thinking about how we use them, reflecting on that, and looking at some of the resources we have at our disposal to take advantage of this shift to virtual. Um, so that's gonna be what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, just a quick run through of, of how we're gonna spend the time. We're gonna first spend the first 20 minutes or so talking about key concepts in audience engagement and virtual events and talk through at a high level through a couple use cases of virtual event data. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit more time going deep on virtual event experience planning in particular, thinking about some of the roles for data in that process. And then we'll talk uh, closer to the end about operationalizing event data. What does it actually look like to access this data, to actually use it, to incorporate it with the rest of your organization systems and processes? We'll have some closing remarks and take a little bit of a break at the end. Uh, I do want to let everyone know after this webinar is over, we are going to have a separate 30 minute block of office hours. Um, so anyone who wants to stick around afterwards, spend a little more time, come with their questions. Uh, we wanted to make a separate space where we could have that conversation. Um, so, uh, so this is what we've got lined up for today. I'm going to jump in. So first and foremost, uh, I am Stefan Bird Kruger. I'm the head of the data strategy team at Parsons TKO. Parsons TKO is a consultancy built around engagement architecture. Engagement architecture is our philosophy and methodology that looks at the people, the platforms, and the processes that mission-driven organizations use to engage their audiences successfully. So through all of this, we see these different components of an organization working together to support one or many different strategies for audience engagement. It helps develop the capabilities we use to engage with those audiences. And through all of it also generates a lot of data that we can use to help improve, enhance, and create new types of engagement with our audiences. So that's a big focus of what we're gonna be talking about today. So in particular, when it comes to virtual events, we're thinking about the tools that you use to both host and also promote those events. The people within your organization who plan it and participate in the events and also externally, your audiences and your guests. There's also all the processes that you go through to prepare these events, to generate content for the event and also use the event to generate content for your audiences as follow-up. Through all of this, you need the capabilities, organizational capabilities to do all this work, to con construct and distribute the materials, to create the event experience. And all of it is likely in support of some longer term audience engagement goal. So thinking about all of those pieces, and the data that flows throughout them and how that data can be reintroduced and feed back into the process uh, to continue improving that overall experience. So I think first I wanna spend a quick minute just thinking through, talking through what virtual events really are. A lot of times when people say virtual events, especially in our nonprofit context, we're thinking about the big conferences, you know, the, the big meetings, a lot of the events we used to maybe have on site in our buildings. And, and that's a huge part. And it's a huge place where we put a lot of effort into convening virtually. But it's important to recognize that virtual events now mean a lot of things. And we are using the same tools, the same technology, the same processes, to have all kinds of conversations. There are some of the more external and informal. If you think about fundraising work, a lot of those personal conversations that you have in, in fundraising and also in programmatic work. If you think about advocacy, going out, talking to stakeholders, talking to key influencers. There's also the team meetings that you might have internally. How does your team work together? All of this is happening in the same virtual space now. And so all of this are opportunities for us to learn from the way that we use these tools, learn about ourselves and learn about our outreach. So we're gonna be talking through a little bit seamlessly some of these different use cases as we talk about virtual events. I wanna start by sharing a little bit of what we learned from ourselves as we thought about our own virtual events. We 
took a look at our own data. In particular, uh, we use Zoom a lot as we are today um, and got a sense of what does it actually look like? How do we use our platforms in these different ways in these different circumstances. Um, we host for a company of our size, we host a, a quite a number of large meetings, uh, you know, eight plus a dozen, sometimes hundreds of participants. But all told, that was still just about 7% of all the meetings that we've hosted in Zoom. Um, in the past, uh, this was a, a six month period in particular, we were looking at from 2020. And so that's a, it's a lot of time and it's a lot of effort and a lot of people, our staff and our guests uh, spend time in there. You know, if you look at all the minutes anyone spent in a Parsons TKO virtual event, it was about a third of all the time people spent in there. But the vast majority of our time and our effort goes into a lot of smaller conversations. If you think about group conversations, um, you know, meetings where we're working with our clients on something, that is about half of all the meetings that we have, half of the time that people spend overall in these meetings. And then not to be discounted, those one-on-one -on -one conversations. And this can once again be conversations that we're having externally with people that we're working with or internally, how do we help one another? How do we collaborate on projects? And that's almost half of all the meetings that we have. And because they're smaller meetings, it's a relatively small fraction of the time that we spend, but it's a big part of the impact of any organization is having those more personal conversations. So I think it's really important for us to, to really think through all of these different sit situations, scenarios, and use cases for virtual convening. So jumping forward, I am going to talk a little bit about some of the use cases and the roles for event data. And as I get this started, I also just want to say, um, uh, please, everyone, feel free to use the chat. Um, we will uh, uh, try to answer questions uh, sort of as we talk and as we go along. Um, and also, we'll try to use any questions that come up and weave them into the rest of the presentation. So when we think of the ways in which we can use the data that comes back from our virtual events to improve the virtual events, um, I think there's a lot of possibility in terms of thinking about the audience experience of coming to and participating in a virtual event. We have to remember virtual events as they are today are often trying to mimic the in-person real world events that we used to have. And even when they are different, there's a lot that we can learn from those experiences. And just as with those in-person events, there's a lot more than the official programming. Uh, there's a lot more to convening virtually that can be done and should be attempted with these tools and the tools that surround virtual events. So when you think about things like fostering informal spaces and personal connections, imagine the, the breakfast table at your last uh, policy briefing. This is a place where people meet each other in the doorway, they talk in the hallway how can people connect with one another and use your event as a place to build their own networks, build their own connections and, and help people really help them feel recognized, I think is a, is a big piece of that. Um, and that's important for everyone who comes. How do we help people feel like they belong there, that they're a part of it and that they can have a voice in that experience. So I think that's a, a big one to focus on and, and that's, that's how you get to personalizing those experiences. It helps people feel much more engaged with the overall uh, uh, event experience. So I think uh, an exaggeration of that feeling is the VIP experience. And this is something that we've all you know, considered and, 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 uh, and focused on in our in-person events as organizations. When your board member walks into the room, if a senator comes in, if your guest speaker arrives, you'll pull them aside. You'll make sure that they feel appreciated for the effort that they put into that event in particular, but I think even more broadly, uh, their role in your organization overall. How do we help people when they participate in things like this feel like they have been noticed and feel like they're getting attention for the attention that they give to you, your organization, and its work? And I think uh, a big part of that recognition, it doesn't all happen in one moment. It doesn't all happen in a Zoom room. 
Um, the tools that we have at our disposal are trying their very best to replicate all those experiences. But in the end, you're going to need to look at the broader ecosystem of outreach and audience engagement and the broader timeline before and after the start and end of the event. So we really wanna focus on giving longevity to an event with supporting content. What happens before they register? What happens between registration and the start of the event? What are the additional touch points that you can have with your audience throughout that whole process? And then afterwards, what happens with the event? Are there minutes that come out of it? Were there conversations that were sparked that maybe weren't a part of the agenda? Are there content, are there uh, derivative content that you can produce based on the event, based on the, uh, the, the thread of the conversation, particular points that were made, um, summary videos, all kinds of things that can come out after the event and, and really help people move forward. So I think this is an important concept and, uh, and I think a, a big part of what people are imagining when they think about improving their virtual events um, is how can we add all of this to our largest effort convenings. Uh, so we're gonna spend a good bit of time, that's gonna be that next section this morning um, and uh, our afternoon rather, um, uh, the next section of, of talking through the virtual event experience and how we can improve that, and in particular, uh, think about the role of data and improving those experiences. Next up, I want to talk a bit about what we can know about our meetings. And, and this comes back to thinking about that long arc, looking at the overall audience journey. When we want to build a profile and understanding of our audience members, and people who either already are or may become key supporters someday in the future, it's important to think through all of the things that we do with them, all the ways in which they engage in our organization, and then consider the meetings as just one of those many types of touch point. And within those conversations, by recognizing them as a part of that overall journey, you'll start to recognize existing relationships they may have. Um, if you're working with somebody, if you're a fundraiser and you're thinking about what your next appeal should be, it can be useful to know everyone in your organization that they've met with, that they've talked to. Again, it's not just the big meetings that they attended, but it's also the conversations they had along the way. Was there a call with one of your analysts that impressed somebody uh, and that inspired them to come to the next big event? Really seeing that whole long story and being able to, to have the attribution of those many touch points into the development of somebody who may someday make a big donation, may participate in, a, in an action, um, uh, be it grassroots or legislative. Uh, there are lots of steps to these uh, audience engagement. And so it's important to recognize uh, the role of, of data in that process. I think another thing that you can start attributing to your events are topics and topical preferences. You know what you talk about in your events and you can keep track of that. And if you can start recognizing how people do or don't engage in a meeting based on, on those topics, you can start to build a better understanding of what motivates them, why they come to you, why they support you, why they believe in your work. And, and that can also then in turn help you with planning those events being able to recognize where people are engaging more or less and how you might wanna to balance topics within each of your events. I think another thing to look for in your virtual events is how your audience participates. What do people contribute to the events? That can be as simple as uh, hitting unmute and speaking up or typing into the chat. A lot of that will happen anecdotally, and it's a, it's a part of the, the discipline of watching these events for your staff to be able to map that back into the overall life cycle and story. Um, but to, you know, to the extent that it can also be automated, you think about things like large events where you may have seen transcriptions um, being generated from the event. And the fact that things like that can then be attributed back to those users and then mapped back into your CRM or your, uh, uh, you know, or however you, you manage information about your, your audience members. Um, so there's a lot of potential and a lot of upside in terms of how the ability to gather really specific, detailed uh, information about what people contribute and how they engage with your content and your virtual events.
Now, I think there's one last use case that is often under underrepresented, undervalued in conversations about virtual events and how they can be, um, uh, or how they support our organizational work, is a lot of the internal roles for convening. Again, especially in this world now where everything is happening virtually, there is a lot of the internal process, the way we work together as teams that are also happening on these same platforms, also generating the same types of data. Digging into this data can provide a lot of information about what is working well, where the gaps are in internal collaboration, and can really help organizations think through how they work remotely. So I think you know, this, this is a, a lens, I don't know how many uh, um, heads of HR we have uh, on the call today, um, but uh, this is, a, you know, if you want to screenshot something, I would screenshot this and send it to your uh, executive team, your HR team, um, because there's a, a lot of potential. I think things you can have here are evaluating company culture, um, how well are staff engaging in these conversations, how balanced are our meetings, how many meetings do we have of different types uh, at, at different scales, um, and, uh, and are there traits about how certain teams are engaging with one another that we might want to replicate and, uh, and learn from and, uh, and have show and tells about to help other teams benefit from those same habits. Where do ideas originate and what fosters this? And, and I think probably one of the most important things to focus on, especially in this time and era where we've all become remote, uh, you know, like it or not, and, uh, and often without the real chance to prepare for it, is being able to track collaboration and find and combat isolation. I think this is a big piece. And, and going back to the example we shared before about how often are people meeting internally, uh, you can imagine new staffer, somebody who's been hired during the pandemic, doesn't have the benefit of our traditional onboarding processes. We don't have the same uh, opportunities for them to wander the halls, for people to stop by their desk and say hello. And so I think the ability to see how people are working together remotely can help highlight and help send up warning signals about isolation, about uh, a lot of how people are or aren't getting left out of a company culture. And, and this is something that can really help leadership guide the way uh, a team works remotely uh, uh, moving forward. And so with that, I'm going to, I think, turn it over to my colleague, Adam Good. Adam, do we have you on today? Yes, I'm here. Excellent, thanks, Adam. Great, thanks, Stefan. Uh, I'm Adam Good. I'm a senior strategist at Parsons CKO, uh, and I am in the lovely remote uh, woods of North Carolina. Um, and we've been having power outages today. So if I vanish uh, in the blink of an eye, uh, it's not because I'm not enjoying talking with you all. Uh, it's because of the power. So uh, yeah, so let's talk about uh, improving events. Um, so what we're going to do in this next section is really talk about some some perspective um, and some frameworks and some questions you can bring to uh, the question of how can we improve the event experience uh, for our audiences, particularly in the time when most of our events are happening online or increasingly online. Um, and as with most things in engagement strategy, a lot of that comes down to to planning. You know, what are our goals for a particular engagement path? Um, you know, who are our audiences? What do they need? What kind of data? do we need and do we want to get out of the engagement path that's going to be uh, useful for increasing engagement with our audiences going forward. So what I really like to do is zoom sort of out a little bit and say, you know, when you think about an event, your audience might be thinking about it as kind of like a specific point in time, you know, at three o'clock on Thursday, I'm going to this particular event. Um, but there is an entire flow of event engagement um, that you should carefully map out, um, you know, for events, and if you do events frequently enough, you probably have elements of this already mapped out or already in your playbooks. Um, but really looking at all the touch points along the way around events before, during, and after events um, to really optimize what are those experiences going to be that will advance audiences down a particular engagement path. Um, so that goes from warming up and really starting to, to uh, to reach out to those audiences. So maybe they get an invitation, uh, an email, or they see it uh, promoted on social media, they register 
and maybe they start reading content or getting involved in social conversations before or right up to or right during the event. You know, I think we had a question about someone, um, uh, you know, retweeting um, some of this uh, material. And that, that's a perfect example of kind of a content and engagement ecosystem that happens around the event. Um, and then there's, you know, how I'm coming out of an event, how do you kind of sustain that, uh, that engagement? really planning out like what are our next steps with the people who attend our event going to be? Are we going to at the very least send them a thank you letter and say, hey, thanks for attending, you know, take this next step or thanks for attending, share with us your feedback. Um, you can do that too, through things like surveys um, or simple follow up emails. And then really thinking in the long term, what are the relationships and actions that we want to nurture uh, and encourage from this event that this event is kind of a, a key piece of. Uh, and again, you know, this, this same sort of process applies from events big and small, right? To what sort of one hour webinars to, you know, three day, um, you know, three day retreats. So really planning through that flow, what are your audiences gonna hear from you when and what do you want them to do can be really valuable um, to, to really optimize not only the event experience for them, but the amount of, you know, engagement you get back from them. All right. So if we if you go back to the previous slide for one second, seven, um, the uh, that that calendar piece in there, you see that there's a little star on the specific date of the event. Um, and one of the things that we've been thinking about um, is, again, really how um, you know time is weird right now. Right. <laughs> no one knows what day it is. I refer to every day as blurs day now. Um, but the, you know, time is becoming a funny thing. And with events, you can really start to see events spreading out over the calendar. So moving from one uh, point, a single point in time to uh, spread out over uh, a longer point of time. So Stefan, if you wanna to go to the, the next slide. Uh, so this is really thinking about that event experience as everything surrounding the event, things that happen before it, things that happen after it. Um, and I'm, I'm using the term here, events as a subscription uh, that I got from my friend uh, Eric Weber over at the US Travel Association um, that is really thinking of, you know, what is the event experience that is going to sustain engagement over time? You know, particularly as, you know, a lot of organizations move from big in-person events that have a lot of face-to-face -face communication and individual touch points uh, and a lot of things surrounding the event, like how do you replicate that online? So thinking of events, as a subscription, you're not just showing up to one place at one particular day, but you're buying into something that, that is going to happen frequently over time. So maybe that outreach that, that gets you, uh, gets your audiences registered initially, you know, consuming content, right, that comes, that sort of trickles in before the event itself, um, conversations that can be encouraged to happen uh, even before the event begins. I remember, yeah, I don't know if if colleges still do this, but when we went to college, all the fresh, all the freshmen read a single book, so they had a common text that they could talk about, you know, for the whole first month of first month of college, um, and then also thinking about the actions that that you want people to take. That can be, you know, attending smaller subgroups, breakout rooms, um, reading specific pieces of content, having conversations, posting to forums. We'll get into some more of those examples later. Um, but I, I really like this events as a subscription idea as a way to kind of break us out of the idea of, oh, we're preparing for a single event. We need to make sure that people show up. We need to make sure we record it and send them a recording afterwards. Shifting that from, okay, what is the experience that we're providing uh, to, to people who are showing up and attending? How can we sustain that experience? Uh, and we have a slide on, on the VIP uh, event experience in a minute, but again, particularly for people who are really valuable to your organization, how can you show them that you uh, recognize, appreciate, and honor that value? So I think from there we can go to the next. And and just to cut in there for uh, for a second, Adam, I think you know what we are doing right now is a perfect example of this. Um, you know, we had something like ninety people register for this webinar. I think we've got thirty-five people in the room. Who is the audience of this webinar? Is it just you of you who made it here, or is it everyone who might watch this afterwards? Is it everyone who signed up because they're interested? And this is something that you hear more and more as people register because they want to see the materials. They're curious about it. They just want to 
register their support and their interest. And so thinking through what is the experience independent of the event itself, uh, that I think is really, really important. Um, so yeah, with that, back to you, Adam. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just piggyback from that step and to say that, you know, thinking through the, the user experience of your events, like what is the actual physical lived experience of people attending your events? Um, I, you know, I, I, I'm not a betting man, but if I were, I'd be willing to bet that, that some of you are kind of taking notes or shock multitasking um, while you're watching this, right? So just uh, like acknowledging that on Zoom, you're in a totally different environment. People are going to be doing different things. So then you have to spend, you know, extra care to say, okay, well, if they're not, you know, here to necessarily engage in conversation, they are here for a reason. What do they, what do they want? What do they need uh, out of this material? How can we make sure to get it to them, uh, you know, in a way that meets them where they are? Um, okay, so um, how can this work? So this is, this is really to illustrate the idea that, you know, you have a lot of different systems in play that can serve different elements of the event experience to your audiences. Uh, and then can provide a certain amount of, of data and insight back to you. Um, so if you know, even if people are signing up through your website for an event, that information can be pulled into Salesforce that then you can use to do direct email um, outreach to some of your more valuable, um, uh, you know, more valuable contacts that you've had sign up. You can do email blasts to everyone who's attended the event. You can start to track people on social media and follow conversations around social media all of which can feed into additional content and additional experiences. Um, so we have the, the Zoom, YouTube, uh, WordPress icons there at the bottom to really talk about you know, what happens after the event. What is that uh, you know, experience uh, of, of capturing content that's gonna be relevant to people beyond just, uh, just the event itself? Um, and then just to articulate a couple of more ideas around the event um, subscription, uh, really to think about, you know, all the different things that can happen in addition to a webinar or presentations during an event. Um, so if you had a subscription, uh, uh, you know, maybe you have exclusive access to pre-event discussions, like a small group of people that get together and have conversations before the event. Um, maybe you could create a co cohort groups around different topics, around different interests that meet over time before, during, and after the event. Um, you know, in, in a lot of uh, you know, influence organizations or mission-driven organizations, just having access to executives and thought leaders within the organi organization can be incredibly valuable. So if you have a webinar that is, you know, going to be attended by 100 people, maybe there are three people that because of their stature in your list or in your organization really would benefit from having some really you know, uh, exclusive time with your uh, executives or thought leaders. And there's some ad uh, additional ideas here. And a lot of it is about you know, what are those more um, boutique or one-on-one -on -one or uh, you know, intimate experiences that, that, you can, uh, that you can provide to, to audience members that really aim to uh, to give that sense of, of value and connection. Okay, so again, talking about the VIP experience, the next couple of slides, a lot of these are gonna be questions or just kind of a, a thought and then some questions. So uh, echoing back to what Stefan said earlier is that you know when you're having events, some attendees are more valuable than others in the sense of what they're bringing to your organization, what they can do for you, whether that's you know monetary contributions, whether that's um, access or influence, um, you know. So if you had an in-person event, you're not going to treat all event attendees the same, right? And, and a lot of well, a lot of ways that in-person events make that happen is that people pay at different levels, right? Even to get you know access to events, and at a sponsorship level, they you know they're important enough that they're willing to give even more money. So thinking about your event again, whether it's large or small. You know, really take the time to think through the audiences for the event. Who are the high value attendees? What makes them valuable to your organization? Um, but just as importantly, what makes your event valuable to them? Um, how are you serving them in online events? Um, Andrea had made a really good um, uh, point the other day when we were preparing this is that a lot of people are going to webinars and uh, maybe they don't show up and they just want the video or they just want the slide deck later. And that's great. I mean, I, I do that all the time myself, honestly. It's like, okay, I know there's going to be good material. I don't have time to sit on another Zoom call, but I want the video. 
So if it's, you know, if the core experience of an event is something that can just be recorded and passed off later, you know, what is that step above and beyond where your valuable uh, audiences are going to really feel like they're getting value that's commensurate to their importance to your organization? So events, uh, you know, so many of the, the events that we attend are really not about the event. Um, the event is actually really the, the people and the conversations and connections that occur, um, you know, surrounding, you know, the, the panels and the talks and the discussions. It's really those, uh, those interactions and exchanges that, that, you know, that create community, that spark ideas, that really get things going. So, you know, online, how do you enable those um, interactions? And also, because it's online, how, how do you track those, right? If, um, you know, if people are coming to your main event and then they're staying in a breakout group after, are you tracking that? Are you saying, hey, we had 100 people come, but these three people stayed and made connections with each other and they talked about this specific topic. And now we know that and we know more about how we can interact with them uh, effectively. So some of the you know just different tactics you can use when you're uh, working on virtual events, um, breakout groups are great. Uh, chat channels. So we have like a main chat channel here, but if you're doing a bigger event, perhaps you'd want a platform, you know, like a, a dedicated Slack account or Slack channels that you could really encourage ongoing conversation around. We, you know, we don't really do this in webinars, but in small groups like icebreakers are always great. Um, you know, particularly since everyone's tired of Zoom, <laughs> everyone's tired of being on meetings, um, times when you can just sort of laugh and, and share your experience are, are really valuable um, in, in having those human connections. I think we can go on to the next one. So events as content generators, the, this was true before, um, uh, before COVID, this will be true after COVID. Um, but you know, one of the ways that you should think about your events is that they are content generating machines. Um, you know, audiences crave content; they need it. Um, you know, you want to provide content that is compelling and that sort of progresses your audiences down your engagement paths. Um, your events create um, a lot of content. And if you're putting a lot of energy into planning your event, getting people to come getting the content ready, lining the speakers up, writing the descriptions, you know, take the additional steps of doing, you know, planning lots of different pieces of content and content engagement around the event. Um, another way of thinking of this is like, what do attendees get beyond just being there? And, and to Stefan's point earlier, people who aren't even there at all, right? What, what do they get? Like, what is the, what is the artifact or the artifacts that, that sort of, um, you know, persist after the event is done. Um, so over on the right are just a lot of the you know, different ideas of things that um, uh, content that can be generated by your event. So I think the, the obvious one is like, okay, we're doing a live webinar, there'll be a video about it later. Um, but during that, you, know, you can do quizzes or polls, um, you can do breakout rooms, uh, you can write blog posts related to your topic you can do white papers, right? You could, you should at least, you know, think about what's what content is already out there that relates to what I'm talking about right now. That then we can package up and say, okay, if you watch this, these are some other things that that might be interesting to you. Um, and again, that's just to say that uh, you know events um, have uh, so much possibility around them, um, and I think it's particularly important now because again, people are. I think so overwhelmed and so over <laughs> scheduled and balancing so many things that, you know, even if they really want to be at a live event, you know, maybe that's not going to be the way that they're actually able to engage. So, you know, what is the, what is the follow up? Um, you know, what does the follow up look like? What's the email to them look like that says, Hey, we're sorry, we didn't see you at the event, but here are the three big points that we thought were most important. And here's a video, um, you know, distilled down to five minutes about the event. Again, and all of this comes back to the planning piece um, that we mentioned a little earlier about the flow of an event engagement. Really thinking through what are why are we even doing this event? Like, what is what is the big picture of what we are trying to accomplish as an organization? And given where we are in time and how our audiences are coming to us online, what are the different touch points that we need to? 
provide and create um, that will that will really provide a, a you know a valuable experience to our attendees and also uh, to ourselves as an organization. Adam, if I may jump in, we uh, got a great question uh, about uh, what did you mean by cohort uh, in that previous slide? Great, great question. Um, yeah, so a cohort is um, um, you know a, a small group of people or a group of people that are in something together, um, right? So people who move through uh, you know a, a university um, or a, a law program together could be said to be part of the same cohort. The idea in in events is that you create um, co like you create cohorts that that work together, talk together, meet together over time around the event. Um, so it, it's kind of like you take the breakout group and you say, okay, you've broken out with these seven people. Now for the next three months, you're going to check in with them once a month and you're going to talk about, um, you know, the content you're getting, or you're going to share ideas, or you're going to be a sounding board for each other. It's kind of like making small micro groups that are still somewhat attached to, to your event or your organization. And if I can illustrate that a little further with an example, um, you know, we uh, were just here an hour today, so we didn't actually do this for this webinar, um, tempted as we were, uh, to break everyone here out into subgroups. Um, and in fact, we had a survey at the beginning. Andrea, maybe if you could drop that survey link in again. We would love to hear from this community, everyone here today, um, and everyone watching this later. Uh, we would love to hear what are your use cases? What are you trying to improve about your virtual events? And what do you want to learn from them? Um, you know, we've talked about development. Um, I know in some of the responses we've gotten so far, um, development departments do a lot of virtual convening. They have a lot of conversations uh, and those one-on-one -on -one conversations really matter. So we could create a cohort around that. You know, let's talk to people who are responsible for development and help them use virtual event data to improve their outreach. Um, I think that uh, similarly, we haven't talked about it, about it much, but let's talk about programmatic work. Let's talk about direct service work. Everyone who does direct service work for your organization, raise your hand and let's get a breakout room around that. Um, so I think that's the kind of work that can be done. How do we identify common threads among our audience in our virtual events and create separate spaces just for them um, so that they can learn together and get custom content for their needs, but then also so they can meet one another and learn from one another. So we just become a platform for our audience to connect. Um, so I think that's, a, that's what we're, we're hoping to get at there. All right. Well, I think, um, Adam, if you're all right, I'll, I'll take over again and we'll move on to the next section. Right on. So that was a lot of what we should hope to do to improve our virtual events. And it was a lot of some of the, the end result of applying our data to create these new experiences, leveraging it. I wanna talk next about what it looks like to use this data. What does the data look like and how do we get at it? How do we bring it in to our experience? So I think one thing first that it's important to note is it is different now. We are in a different time. Uh, event data used to mean getting data from our live in-person events, our offline events. Uh, this meant getting data from a very diverse set of sources, uh, ticketing systems from you know people actually scanning people into theaters and auditoriums um, uh, for you know, in-person events, it meant uh, having people go in and, and log uh, their information um, in something like Salesforce, a lot of manual data entry. Um, uh, I think anyone who's done grassroots work for a long time will certainly be familiar with the sign-up sheet, um, that piece of paper full of important information that gets stuffed in a bag. Um, so it, it was pretty complex. It was, it was not a straightforward thing. And all of this required tremendous governance and discipline to ensure that it happened. Uh, very often those signup sheets got lost and, and never seen again. Um, and so there's just a lot of work that always went into gathering event data. It was tough. It was tough to work with and especially consistently across different types of events. This world, where we are doing so much virtually. In a lot of cases, all of those different conversations all got moved onto the same platform. They're all on Zoom now. Um, and because of that, a lot of that data got normalized. It started getting automatically collected. 
um, it is important to note that we lost control over what type of data we collect. We are locked into the data choices of the platforms that we choose. What they collect, what they keep is up to them, but we have access to it. And now it is consistent. It's consistent across, um, across a lot of these different types of meetings. Uh, because it is in this new format, it doesn't mean it's easy to get at. It does require engineering and or a lot of work. Um, it requires uh, thoughtful technical integration in order for us to leverage it well. So that's what we're talking about right now. Um, but in either case, whether it was offline or virtual, we still have the same challenge of focusing on reporting and adoption. The data can exist, we can have access to it, but what are we gonna do with it? And so that's why those use cases up above are really important. We need to decide what we wanna accomplish with this data now that, uh, now that there is more of it. Um, I just wanted to share, so I mentioned at the beginning some of what we learned about our own data. Um, here's a quick little uh, screenshot of, this is a dashboard that we built. So this is Parsons TKO's own data from six months of our Zoom meetings company-wide. Uh, you can see in six months, we had 1,500 meetings uh, in Zoom um, and, uh, and you know, lots and lots of people. And, and we were able to get all of this information down comprehensively across the organization so we can start to identify trends. We can start to see things like how often do we use 101s uh, as a way to advance work? Um, what does the spread of meetings throughout our workday look like? Um, when are, when are good, when's a good time to schedule an all-staff meeting uh, you know, based on, on trends and how people usually work together? So I think there's a, th these are just the tip of the iceberg in terms of possible things that we could mine this data set for. I think what's important to know about creating this type of experience is that you wanna have a single source of truth for your event data. And that means not just getting it together, but presenting it with appropriate context. You know, what, what does this data actually represent? How should we be interpreting it? What are the right ways to use the data? And so having one place where analysts can all go and, and answer these questions in, a, in an honest and consistent way with the right caveats. Um, and then figuring out, you know, once we understand the data better, we understand what it can and shouldn't be used for, then we know we can start actually having it feed back into our systems. So we can start to have things like that, that life cycle and understand where meetings exist in the life cycle. And we can find the appropriate ways to uh, integrate that data back in, even if we have a heterogeneous platform environment. So some organizations, they're not just using Zoom. Uh, it's a little bit of Zoom, a little bit of WebEx, a little bit of Teams. Um, and so doing the best that we can across that heterogeneity uh, and to, to bring it together and, and introduce it in a consistent way or as consistent as we can get it um, so that it fits alongside your ticketing system, which you may still use um, even in a, in a virtual world. Um, so being able to, to aggregate all that together uh, effectively. So across the virtual platforms, the ones that are most common, um, the types of data you can actually get. You can get lists of participant names. You can actually see you know, who are the people who, who came to each meeting. Um, and you can have how long they joined. When did they join? How long did they stay? Um, you know, across all your meetings, do you get a sense that, hey, actually most people join four minutes into the meeting. So let's just plan on that being the start time. Um, uh, you know, the, what are the lessons you can learn overall, but then also individually, you know, imagine mapping this back, you know, hey, this person always just stays for the first half of the meeting. And so if we're really making the meeting for that one guest, um, let's make sure that we front load the story uh, at the first part. What does attrition look like uh, during these meetings? And what are the trends meeting to meeting that might tell you about certain topics or certain uh, styles of presentation? Um, Email addresses with limitations. It does vary platform to platform and how people are connecting to the meeting, um, whether or not that information is shared with you or not. Um, but when it is available, once again, you do have at least consistency. It might not be complete, but it is consistent. What gets captured and what you have access to. The email address one is very important. Um, you know, uh, Systems that do provide it then give you the ability to map the data from your virtual events back to the rest of your ecosystem. 
your contact management system, your email system. We use email address as a key for a lot of what we do organizationally. Um, and so, so this is the, the key to really being able to use this data um, for, for comprehensive organization-wide use cases. Um, other things that you can get, location, again, with some limitations, some platforms give you more or less about where the person is dialing in from. Um, and then, of course, there's the topical context. What was the meeting about? What was its title? Um, and, uh, and then how can we, how can we use that information uh, to, to give more color to what we know about a person? Uh, if we know the title of the meeting, then we can, we can infer or map back to another data set. Uh, what topics has this person been exposed to across all of the meetings? How many of them were, were one-on-ones um, uh, versus webinars? Um, and then uh, also some of these systems give you more technical information. So uh, Google Meet in particular, um, their logging system is meant for debugging um, first and foremost. So, so that's a major focus uh, of that platform. So just to illustrate this a bit more, um, here's another sort of what it could look like. So you can imagine if you have most of your data in Zoom, um, that's where it gets collected. Uh, and once again, it's getting collected automatically. It is important to know a lot of these systems, I would almost even say most, do have data retention policies, which means that six months and older, it is there sometimes, you may be able to access it, your ability to access it at scale starts to fade. So Zoom, uh, their API only lets you go back six months uh, if you wanna get down everything. Um, it is. Uh, somewhat possible to go back and get individual reports, um, but you know, you saw for us, we're a small company, we had 1500 meetings, uh, that's 1500 CSVs you gotta download. Uh, it starts to get hard the longer, the longer you go. Um, and so, uh, so I think there's a, just a, a, an important caveat there for anyone who's looking to recreate what happened throughout COVID era. Um, but so you've got your, da your data where it is, you need to figure out what your pipeline looks like. How do you get the data out of that place? So I just talked about um, APIs and automating that extraction. If you wanna do this at scale, I really recommend it. Um, and then you can get it into the rest of your eco ecosystem, get it into something like Salesforce. Um, how do you map the individual data back into your CRM records um, so that your development staff looking at a profile can see what their uh, virtual event exposure was like to the organization as they start a, a, an appeal. Um, and then last but not least, uh, reporting. Um, so once you have all this data, what format do you wanna put it out into so that the right teams at your organization can access it and ask new questions of that data set. Uh, and this is just expanding on that point that I made. How do we move this data around? Um, uh, you can do this manually. Uh, all of these tools have the, the possibility of sort of event by event manual export. Um, they've got administrative dashboards you can go into. You can run reports on individual meetings. You can download those CSVs. Um, if you uh, have some spreadsheet foo, you can add them together, blend them together. Um, this is really achievable, attainable, and effective if what you're doing is trying to answer really point questions. I wanna see this series of five events and I want a complete picture of all of them. Um, there's, there's nothing wrong with doing that by hand. Um, it's when you're trying to do things organization wide that you'll wanna get into the automation. How do we design a flow that gets all of it together consistently so that we know we can ask the same questions again, six, 12, 18 months from now. And uh, yeah, and so that's, that's the end of our content um, for today. Um, as, uh, as Andrea noted at the beginning, we are going to have uh, office hours after this. Um, and so we'll, we'll take a short break um, and then uh, anyone who wants to stick around, ask some questions or hear other people ask questions, uh, please feel free to stay right here um, and, uh, and we will have a room for that. I think just for some parting thoughts, um, you know, there is, there's an incredible amount of potential and potential in use cases across an organization, uh, including leadership decisions, uh, sort of company structure decisions. I think one of the things that we are, are thinking about is what does the future of convening look like? Uh, so much of it is remote 
right now, um, uh, we actually have a, a, an internal four sites practice that we're developing where we're thinking through what are the odds? What are the odds? What does the balance look like that virtual events stay as major a part of the portfolio now as they are? Um, does it all go away? Um, uh, you know, do we go back to fully in-person meetings? Is there a cultural revolution that says never again with virtual uh, events? Um, or does this become a, a permanent and large part of the portfolio for organizations? Uh, these are big questions and, and organizations face big decisions, both about how they wanna structure, what they wanna invest in their virtual events, and then also what they wanna invest in using the data to both improve the events and the rest of their outreach. Um, so, so I think you know these are are some 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 big choices that we're going to be making in the the months to come. Um, so I think that's uh, the the end of my thoughts there, Adam. Adam, if there's anything else you wanted to chime in, um, just uh, keep having events, <laughs> keep connecting with each other, um, and uh, and let us know how we can help. Excellent. Very good. Well, as I noted, we're going to take a five minute break uh, and uh, we'll be turning off our, our mics and cameras, but we'll, we'll come back in a bit. Uh, in the meantime, if there are any questions, please put them in the chat. We'll keep watching that and, uh, and we can use that to spark the office hours in case people are shy. Um, but uh, but we're, we're looking forward to continuing the conversation. And, uh, and in the spirit of uh, what comes after, please, everyone, feel free to reach out. Um, this was the middle of our engagement story uh, around virtual events with, uh, with each of you. And, uh, and we really want to continue supporting uh, everyone as they answer these questions for themselves about the, what they want to accomplish.